the last tensor that we'll talk about in this class is the compliance and stiffness tensors. They're fourth rank tensors. And they're fourth ranked because we're relating stress and strain, uh, which are each in their own right, second rank tensors, second rank field tensors. So in this case now, we're gonna say, all right, stress is my applied force and uh, strain will be the displacement. Uh, the product is energy and um, what I will do is um, that'll force me to have a uh, fourth rank tensor because I have to relate to second rank tensors. So let's uh, talk a little bit about what we have here. So I've already mentioned that I'm going to take a sigma ij and I'm going to relate that to my strain. Very important property, obviously. And that's going to force me to have interestingly enough this is called stiffness and then I could write it the other way Sorry, forget about the equal sign. Um, times sigma KL. And this is called the compliance. So great mystery, but obviously it's probably because of different language or something. But in English, the easy way to remember it is that C, right, which is the proportionality between strain and stress, is actually stiffness, which has the S in it, where it's the opposite, so compliance actually has the S, right? So C, S, S, C, right? So uh, unfortunately it's reversed for English, but then once you realize that, you can probably remember that pretty easily. So you can see that the um, symmetry play a very important role when working with uh, these types of tensors because um, epsilon, is a second rank, right? And so there's nine components here. Sigma is a second rank, as we've already discussed, nine components here, which means that in the general case, there's 81 uh, elements here in the middle uh, to deal with, okay? Uh, there really isn't too much to say, uh, except uh, we've already, you know, gone through most of the properties. You know what this means, uh, but let me just point out that um, a lot of times, as long as you're not, again, transforming axes, it may be practical to now uh, uh, take our sigma 1, 1, sigma 1, 2, uh, sorry, 2, 2, sigma 3, 3, and take this. And remember, just because we did it for, uh, the first time we did it was for the case of, uh, just because we did it for the case of um, piezoelectricity first, because the notation got uh, unwieldy, it's going to be pretty clear that transforming this into the other notation like we did last time can be useful, very useful, if we're staying in the same coordinate system. So I can then write this as sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, sigma 4, sigma 5, sigma 6. But, um, you know, and, and that allows me to think about it if I want as a big long vector, right, etc. So this notation allows me then to write, uh, you know, sigma i 
equals C I J epsilon J because I write epsilon the same way, right? Now, the only problem is, again, do not transform uh, in this notation because this has become a matrix. That's a matrix and not a tensor anymore. We're not attached with that notation. Remember how any time we play the, with the notation, I've stressed in this class over and over again that it has real impact on what you're talking about, whether you're transforming from new to old or old to new, old to new coordinate system or whatever. So here we're actually getting rid of notation. We're you know, creating new notation. So of course it doesn't make sense to do any kinds of transformations in that system. So again, uh, if you're within that coordinate system, that's fine. But if you're going to do any kinds of, of transformations, you have to come back out of uh, that notation. And of course, don't forget this as implications, just like it did for the PO's electricity of the factors of two, right? So, you know, our strain tensor, don't forget, you know, epsilon one, one, et cetera, right? Uh, just remember that you're going to have epsilon one, but then you're going to have to have one half epsilon six and odd things like that, right? And one half epsilon five, et cetera. Because um, remember, you have factors of two when you do this transformation. So you have to keep track of those factors of two as well. So there's a benefit, which you don't have to keep track of all these indices. And it makes it a little bit easier because you can think about a second rank tensor here and two vectors. So it's kind of reduced it. It's very clever. But you have to understand what the limitations are for that system. So let's just finish our stress and strain now. We've already done all this before, so hopefully. Uh, but I want to show you the same kinds of transformations and the simplification you can do when you have the full thing written out in terms of in, in terms of compliance. All right. So here's the compliance, and we're only drawing half here because uh, there's no need to to write out the symmetric part. Oh, and I forgot to say that that don't forget for equilibrium purposes here. Remember, we've already discussed this in a previous lecture, but make sure that you realize that sigma ij equals sigma ji. Remember, that was an important part of uh, the uh, equilibrium so that it doesn't rotate. So that's why uh, we only have to draw half of them, right? Uh, the second thing is triclinic, of course, beautiful. We have all 21 that we have to keep track of. Um, drastic reduction, the minute we put a two-fold axis, again, here it's along the x3 axis, and you just get boom, all of a sudden uh, we can eliminate a lot, of, a lot of factors, right? And again, by now you should be familiar with this technique of how to do this, but if you now not only put a two-fold axis along x1, but along x2 and x3, you end up with all these zeros. Uh, here you can see already that... Uh, uh, now, the more symmetry add, the, um, uh, the fewer elements we have to worry about. Uh, here also, uh, you can tell that, um, it, you know, of course, there is no problem with inversion. You can see here that we have, um, uh, we have uh, uh, inversion center here in 4 over M. Right, it doesn't eliminate all that, and that's because it's a fourth rank tensor, not a cube, bit, not a, th a third rank tensor. Right, um, as usual, as you go up in uh, symmetry, right, there's fewer to keep track of. This is the the great benefit of a lot of important materials classes being cubic, is that we don't have to keep track of all of these, you know, we only have basically three on the diagonal over here that we can just write as S44, and then we have uh, uh, one here. The diagonals are the same, and then these guys. So there's only three out of all this. We only have to worry about three in the cubic case, which is really, really fortunate. Uh, hexagonal, uh, still plenty to worry about. Um, you know, unlike... Uh, yeah, so, and of course, the higher symmetries knock out more elements. And then finally at the bottom here is something you'll see often where uh, a material might be polycrystalline. And so what happens is uh, you have to make some assumptions. And if you think about it, 
uh, this is very similar to cubic, right? Because uh, in in the cubic system, remember we had all zeros over here. We had these three diagonals, and and we had these to worry about, right? The only difference between this and cubic is that in the cubic case, we had you know s44 as an independent variable here, and what we're seeing here is that the uh, the uh, because of the symmetry that we're assuming that it's equal in all directions, you can just have these as the um, as um, uh, expressed in terms of the S11 and the S12. So isotropic and cubic are you know nice um, uh, nice materials to deal with when dealing with stress uh, and strain. Now in the next lecture, what I want to do is come back and talk a little bit about, all right, uh, it's pretty clear that when you have stress and strain with tensor, we get stiffness compliance. So in terms of dealing with CIJKL, or SIJKL, everything is very clear. Uh, what we start to do though is combine these into moduli. And that's where actually things get confusing. And so my recommendation to you is that if you're doing fundamental work in this area, uh, what I found was that we had to go back to the fundamentals because there's a lot of errors in papers dealing with so, um, abbreviating the CIJKL or SIJKL moduli, especially the CIJ, because most of the tabulated stuff is in this form, CIJKL. And uh, you have to know if you use moduli under what conditions they're, um, you know, creating these moduli and whether that applies to um, your particular system. So we're going to talk about moduli because it's very important to get that right. But I think you can see that as long as you go back to the basic CIJKL, uh, stress and strain are uh, fairly straightforward and you can use symmetry to reduce a lot of the elements that you need to know about in the stiffness and compliance uh, matrices, uh, tensors.